sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. <laughs> Welcome to a clinical version of Security Guy Radio with Chuck BFD Harold and my non co well, you're my co host today, Mr. Travis. Can you, you don't have a microphone again? Why don't you get a microphone? Oh, we'll fix that in post, too. All right. Uh, so, been traveling around uh, Pacific Northwest about a month. And uh, before that, I was at ATAP and I met uh, Rachel Dempsey. And we decided we're going to do a series, four, possibly five, about uh, psychology and pathology and all kinds of very interesting things. And uh, my guests today are Rachel Dempsey, P, oh, psych, PSYD. Doctor of Psychology. There you go, Doctor of Psychology. Michelle Visipal and Venus Klinger. And that's why I said Chuck Harold, uh, BFD, because really I don't have any acronyms. I wish I did. <laughs> it's too bad. So we're going to do five series, and our first series today is going to be about um, psychopathy and personality disorders, which I'm all for, <laughs> because I'm sure I have a few of them. I have my handwriting analyzed. <laughs> In a show about six months ago, and boy, that was pretty close. So this will be really interesting. Now, the lead today is going to be Rachel, right? Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. Michelle's going to be the lead today, right? Okay, good. So uh, your company is Psychological Assessment Incorporated. You guys are out of San Francisco. And tell us what you guys do as general for the company. What, you know, what, is, what is your focus of your business? Uh, psychological Assessment Incorporated offers all different types of psychological assessment, including forensic assessment, neuropsychological assessment, uh, accommodations testing for kiddos with ADHD and learning disabilities. Uh, in the forensic realm, we use all different types of tools to look at risk assessment. Uh, we also have two sex offender specialists, Dr. Vizipal and I. Uh, we uh, offer treatment for sex offenders, and we also have a contract with the regional center to offer um, competency evaluations for their clients. We should probably do that, Travis, for our show, a competency evaluation. <laughs> People question all the time whether I should be on the radio. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, when I met you at ATAP, I was really amazed at the depth of this. I mean, you know, we know about uh, the Minnesota Multiphysical Personality Inventory Test, which mm. I've taken 15 times, I think, <laughs> and strangely passed every single time. Uh, that's what they used to, you know, kind of screen police officers. One of the tests, right? Sure. Uh, and it's like six hundred questions, and that was interesting. But so you're in in the forensic, you call forensic neuropsychologist. So you're concerned with the evaluation and cause of people's behavior. Is that? Go ahead, describe it. That's right, and we're also interested in treatment recommendations or recommendations to the court. Uh, talk about that real quickly. Um, we are offered... Uh, Court ask, hires you to evaluate somebody. Right, in a number of different realms, whether it be asking the question if someone is competent to stand trial or asking the question if someone is not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, that's Ms. Klinger's um, favorite topic. Right. And so we will often do testing and then offer specific recommendations either to individuals or the courts or the attorneys, depending on what the recommendation or the assessment referral is. So on Law and Order, you're the guy that they would send to to say, let's check him out. Who was that character actor? He's not on the show anymore. B.D. Wong yeah. uh, was the actor. Yeah, remember? Oh, he was great. You don't see him fantastic. as much anymore. But yeah. So you would be that sort of person that comes in and makes those evaluations. Yes. Interesting. All right, well, we're going to have a, this is going to be a great show because I there's a so. lot of different topics to cover. Uh, so let's go over what we're going to cover in the next topic. So you tune into Security Guy Radio for all, the, all of them, right? So we're going to do topic one. It's going to be psychopathy and personality disorders. And we're going to talk about pedophilia. And we're going to talk about, uh, pronounce that Japanese word for me again. Hentai? Oh, hentai. Hentai, which is a form of Japanese animation, pornographic in nature, which I had no idea. I thought, mm -hmm. you know, I probably shouldn't watch Speed Racer anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Erotomania, which is a, the stalker kind of syndrome we're talking about, right? That's right. And then risk assessment uh, for danger to self or others in school-based uh, school uh, settings. All right, so those are, these are interesting topics, and I want everybody to watch all five series, and we're going to start right now with Ms. Michelle, and we'll talk about psychopathy and personality disorders. Now, I was looking at you know, trying to research some of this to sound half intelligent. Uh, and I actually subcontracted the work to somebody that's more intelligent than I and came up with some interesting questions. Uh, but just kind of give us a whole general idea of what this topic is and what it entails. So we'll be talking about personality disorders first and then psychopathy included kind of in that and 
in addition to. Um, so we'll start with personality disorders. Basically, they're an inflexible pattern of behavior and thinking that oh. affects social functioning. So you can have a personality disorder and not be clinically insane or non-functional, or you can just be kind of wacky and eccentric or something. Correct. Non-flexible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we'll talk about psychopathy, which is a series of traits kind of that come all together to build this psychopath persona, if you will. So what is wrong with somebody being inflexible? I mean, <laughs> sometimes that's necessary, right? I mean, Well, to have the diagnosis of personality disorder, it really has to cause problems with uh, your functioning. <laughs> but the problem with the personality disorder is most people feel comfortable with it. It's <laughs> called egocentric, right? Right. And it's persistent. It covers more than one part of your environment. Okay. So it'll be at work. It'll be at home. It'll right. be in all your interpersonal relationships. The way I think of a personality disorder is I um, tell my classes that we all have a role around us that comes from our childhood and the lessons that we learned in our childhood. And brick by brick, we build that wall to keep ourselves safe. And a personality disorder is when that wall becomes inflexible and causes problems in your life. Well, can it be also useful if it's used as a defense mechanism in domestic violence, let's say? You have to be non-flexible to not be attacked or something like that. No. Uh, the, a personality disorder is actually what keeps people in domestic violence situations. Keeps them in. Mm -hmm. No, explain that. Well, <laughs> I keep on looking at Venus. She well, can. anybody can explain. Well, Even you, Ms. Michelle, yeah. our, 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 our quiet psychologist over there. <laughs> So if you have traits specific, like dependent personality, where you want um, someone to take care of you, you kind of are, uh, oh, yeah. I lost my words. No. <laughs> In dependent personality disorder, someone is looking to someone else to answer all the questions for them, mm -hmm. give them an opinion. Take they control. Take control. Okay. They're, they're really lost in finding those answers for themselves, and they have a lot of anxiety about... Uh, coming up with any kind of decision, yeah. so they turn to someone else saying, "Please give me that, give me an answer," because finding that answer or making a decision is overwhelming for me, and they they push that out in all points of their life. Right. All right, work, <laughs> personal, kids, whatever. And right. they they draw for it. So. And they they pull for it. Yeah. So in a domestic violence situation where it's dangerous for them to continue, they continue to do it. And so they might actually choose someone who has a different type of personality disorder to lead them. Who, who would you th say, what sort of personality disorder might be the perpetrator? Or antisocial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so they might pair with an antisocial person. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. Or narcissistic. Or narcissistic. Well, narcissistic, or, or I Or a could psychopath. Say. Yeah. Or a mm -hmm. psychopath. So if, if I'm a person that doesn't want to make decisions, here, here's my idea about conflict. I believe all conflict is the avoidance of conflict. Does that make any sense? I think people do more to avoid pain than they do to seek pleasure. OK, so if I don't want you mad at me, uh, instead of saying I disagree with what you're doing or I'm not happy with that or something, people tend to be quiet. And if you have a personality like this where you're looking for people to make decisions for you, I think if you had on the other side of the relationship as a boss, I would just build up to go, well, why didn't you tell me that six months ago? I, you know, well, they they, don't but they're know, incapable. Yeah, they're, they don't know that that's what they're doing. It's right. just something that they do naturally. Yeah. So and they're avoiding conflict that way in a lot right. of ways, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the whole point for a personality disorder is it is your ego defense, but it's gone awry and it's causing you problems rather than just defending and keeping you safe. So, Michelle, what type of personalities uh, in this with this behavior might we also identify? We're talking, here, I, I get it in a domestic violence situation. So there's also avoidant personality disorder. Okay. Um, basically not wanting to confront anything, kind of keeping to yourself, wanting to be alone. Um, that's probably the best one, avoidant. Right, avoidant and, and uh Would that be a person that's a shut-in, kind of, where they you know, live in a house? and? No, actually, that would be more of a schizoid oh, personality I need a, disorder. Get my matrix, <laughs> get my schematic here. There's, everybody's got a different personality well, thing. There, there's actually several different personality yeah. disorders that the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual outlines, and they are clustered into three different clusters. And there are certain clusters that are more likely to be victims, and there's more clusters that are more likely to be perpetrators. Oh, so what are, do, do we know what those clusters are? What are the, uh, what are the groups? Cluster A, suspicious and odd. Cluster B, Wait, which wait, is let's take one at a time. Suspicious and odd. <laughs> I just got odd. categorized into a whole bunch of areas <laughs> here. <laughs> no, but I mean, 
explain that because that's very broad, right? So there's the schizoid, the schizotypal. What else do we have in there? Uh, yeah, but you're using big words that I can't the, spell, so you got to explain I what think that means. Paranoid is the uh, paranoid. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That's yeah. Right. And uh, the the schizoid is the one that is the shut in. That mm-hmm. that's the old curmudgeon that lives at the end of the block that no one ever talks right. to. Schizotypal is the eccentric, the magical thinking. Um, so we uh, usually don't see very many of these mm. um, individuals with personality disorders. It's really the other two clusters that we see in therapy and in the correctional setting. Now, I would argue that um, you've just described half the people in this studio. <laughs> well, I'm serious, right? Well, because, everyone but, has ego defenses, but well, is it, does, does of, it cause them problems? Well, uh, not only does it maybe not cause problems, it causes uh, positive outcomes. If you're creative people, creative people are very, I don't know how to describe it to you, uh, manic, up and down, energetic. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I should be locked up because if I, I'm going to go home and do your show and I'm not going to go to sleep until I get all five of these shows edited. Mm. And I might be up, literally, I might be up two days. I'm not exaggerating. That Coffee, like editing, I got to get it done. Obsessive compulsive. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of, but I just, when I get into the creative process, I, it's a different way to think. I can't describe it to you. It's sure. just, you're consumed by it and you want to finish the product and get it done. Um, but that's not interfering with your functioning. Well, I think some people in my house might disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> to actually, a lot. Right. But well, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, they could say, "Wait, you're, that's all you're doing. You're not doing anything else." What? You've got um, other personality traits, right? So, for example, a narcissistic personality trait might be someone who is uh, wanting to be the best, wanting to put out there that they are able to do everything and have no flaws and are competent and uh, project an air of confidence Mr. in everything Jarvis. that they do. Did did she just call me a narcissist? Mm. I think she did. Think and she did. narcissistic <laughs> falls under cluster B, which is dramatic. <laughs> right. Oh, my God. I, I'm going to... And we have to lock me up at the end of the show. We see a lot of individuals with narcissistic traits, not necessarily the personality disorder in the show business and in the corporate world. Well, I mean, you almost have to be. I am not comfortable on camera. I switched to this studio when they put us on camera, and it, what, it took me about a month, right, Travis, to go... Mm-hmm. What am I supposed to look at? What am I supposed to do? You know, especially if somebody's Skyping in and there's nobody in the studio. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, and I, I got past that, but I do not like listening to myself and I do not like hearing myself or see myself. But that's the business. I got to do it, mm-hmm. right? So in a personality, in our business, there are people that would like doing that, like looking at themselves, like hearing themselves. Is that Would that cross into narcissistic then? Not necessarily. No? All right. No. Well, there, distinguish in the in entertainment I, business, you see a lot of this, well, right? Well, I mean, uh, the the most famous narcissist that we all know is running for president. Who's that? <laughs> oh, that guy. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, uh, I don't even have to say his name, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, that guy. Right. Yeah. Because we can all see it. He wears his narcissism on his sleeve. Yeah. Ted yeah. Cruz, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right, so... Cluster A, cluster B, or cluster C? Uh, yes. So there's the suspicious and odd, the... Uh, Avoidant. Wait a minute. Do we no, really get dramatic. into what's, do we get into uh, what's sorry. suspicious? And then there's the anxious. Do we get into what suspicious and odd is exactly? Is the person suspicious himself? Or you're looking at him saying that guy's suspicious and odd? So the pattern. Yeah. So there's the avoidant, the okay, schizoid, so this and the a, schizotypal. Okay. Mm-hmm. Since we're on radio, we have to have more than a monosyllabic response. Mm-hmm. So give me a little, a little blurb on that. So the avoidant is not wanting to interact, uh, mm-hmm. avoiding the confrontation. The schizoid is uh, wanting to be alone, isolated. Okay. And the schizotypal is really the eccentric thinking, also piece of the isolated. Magic thinking, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, But the suspicious thinking. guy is what? He's suspicious of other people or people are suspicious of them? I think that what they do makes people suspicious of them. How they act. And, right. Okay. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You expect something to happen, and so you do things with the expectation of it's going to happen. When it happens, you've reinforced that. That makes sense. Right. All right. So here's my... The paranoia, if you will. Here's my uh, divergence from you, with you guys a little bit. <clears throat> I've seen all these personalities in my work, police work, sure. right? You go, oh, yeah. And I couldn't classify them and tell what you are. I would just say... Dangerous, not, 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 not dangerous, you know. And if you're not dangerous, I leave you alone more or less, right? But we used to have 5150 people, and that means that we, it's a police officer, or let me get this right, a psychiatrist only, not, mm-hmm. not yourselves, ladies, right? But a psychiatrist can lock somebody up for a 72 hour evaluation. Am I correct? Is that still the law? 
Um, I believe it's more people than that can 5150. Right. Yeah. A mental health professional. And usually what happens is the uh, the policeman uh, will take the individual to the hospital. And at that point, they are uh, 5150. All right. What was that music, Mr. Jarvis? Rolling Thunder. It sounds good, yeah. but <laughs> very dramatic. But and to emphasize my point, <laughs> you're put in the hospital very dramatically. Hey, let's take a quick break, and we'll be back in a minute on Security Guy Radio. Okay. What was that? I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> I don't know what that is. It's like an old steam heater or something like that. Yeah. All right. We'll get back. All right. Welcome back to Security Guy Radio with... Our forensic neuropsychologist team from Psychological Assessment Incorporated out of San Francisco, California. And your website is psychassessment.us. That's right. All right. So don't forget the .us. Everybody's going to go to .com. It's .us. And I'll put that up on the screen when we continue. So we're just talking about our, our clusters of personality disorders. We left off with um, Cluster B. 5150, though. No, we're talking oh. about 5150, right? So right. it used to be that a, a cop or a psychiatrist could could commit you. When I go to an emergency room and the doctor would say, I want you to commit that guy. And I go, well, why? Why don't you do it? Well, I can't because an MDs couldn't mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, I would say, what's the date? And who's the president? Mm -hmm. And what did you have for breakfast? And, you know, a couple questions of functionality. And are you living in the street? Yeah. How come? Well, because my wife kicked me out and I, I don't have a place to go. That's not crazy to me. It's no. unfortunate. Right. But they wanted to get people into the system, I think, in some degree, get them checked into a bed because NPI at UCLA was, you know, low on uh, candidates or something. And I would refuse and because I took it very seriously, right? I mean, I thought, I, I don't want to put somebody in that system if they really shouldn't be in that system. Although one can argue that's a good way to help people too, right? You know, get them off the street and stuff. So what's going on now with that? I Here's my here's my deal. So hmm, we're all a little weird. We all have our picadillos and things and eccentric personalities and things. But is there a danger in having this all cross over into – Mm, institutionalizing people because they're a little different than us. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not, I know you guys have to use it for some kind of metric and measure to say, all right, you're going to make this guy the CEO of the company. Here's what's going on. He likes uh, pornographic Japanese cartoons, and we got to deal with that. I, you know what I'm saying? Where, where do we draw the line on functionality? I'm, I'm functioning, and I'm crazy. It's difficult to get someone right? 5150. Is difficult. it? Yes. yes. Okay. It's taking away the civil liberties. Yes. Right, but see, remember when they opened up all the beds and there was everybody's in a psych institution and you know orphanages and we had all those things and then they said let's get rid of all that. Now my opinion is those people on the street are those people that would have been or should have been getting help. You're somehow. absolutely right. That's why we have a homeless population today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, what? What? Is there any statistics on that with the percentage of people that are you know clinically you know diagnosable as some kind of problem? There, there are, and it's interesting. Uh, the I, I'm not going to make up statistics on the spot, but I could. Um, the inverse, we do it all the time no, here. It's true. Uh, th I've seen a lot of charts that look at the amount of people in prisons versus the amount of people in state hospitals. You know, a hundred years ago versus right, now, right. and how it's inverse because no, it makes sense. that the prisons are where people with mental health issues end up. So um, to come back to your question with regard to, you know, if someone is a danger to themselves or others, then, of course, we need to protect. That's an easy one. Right. right. But, you know, if I, um, I don't know, if I'm slightly antisocial and narcissistic and, I, you know, a couple of these things going on here in clusters A, B and C and I'm borderline. Uh, I mean, you know, if uh, if my if you did an evaluation on me as an employee and I get fired because of it. Is that a problem? Well, theoretically, you wouldn't be fired because of it. That's not grounds for being fired. Well, I know it's you not grounds. You would have had to have done something. Yeah, mm -hmm. But I'm talking about reality behind the scenes. And I, it's not grounds for being 5150 either. No, that I get. It's not that extreme, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Pre-employment, a lot of things go on in pre-employment that are you know supposed to follow a certain path legally, right? So let's talk about evaluating people in pre-employment. Let's talk about post-employment. And maybe let's talk about court um, evaluations of these personalities. So... If I'm going to come to you, Michelle, and say, you know, I'm going to hire Chuck for the radio show, but he's, I think he's a little weird. What do we do about that? <laughs> How are you going to do a test on me? Uh, you know, go through the process. I assume it's voluntary. I assume I have to submit to it if I want to get a job, right? So sure. talk about how sure. that works. 
Um, well, definitely it's voluntary. It has to have consent form, all of that stuff signed. I actually don't do any pre-employment testing, so I might defer to a colleague oh, okay. <laughs> that might be better suited to answer that question. Right. We, uh, we do do uh, pre-employment testing at uh, PAI. I've done most of them. And what happens is we do do personality testing, a full clinical interview, and we also uh, look at background checks. So if they've passed a background check, they have no problems with um, substance abuse, domestic violence, other issues. Issues, then just having personality quirks isn't the you know reason to hire or not hire someone. Uh, now, in the corporate side of things, when we do an evaluation for team building, we also have corporate services where uh, our organizational psychologist will go into different companies and help build the teams within the companies. Oh, that's interesting. That that might be a place where we can look at personality quirks and what might be getting in the way of an individual actually being able to be successful with the team. But in a lighthearted way. In other words, we're not probably going to go to termination because somebody's right. the wacky guy in the crowd or something like that, right? And that would never happen. I mean, right. we, we well, <laughs> believe me, it happens. In general, it's not supposed. Not to. on your side. I know. I know. I know. It's all good right. intentions, but right. Uh, I remember at uh, Disney they gave us a test, and I can't remember the name of it. I'm sure you'll know, but they and they take a box and you know the top box is a driver the other box is a analytical the other box is an emotional these are four personality types mm -hmm. and they ask you a bunch of questions you're supposed mm -hmm. to put a dot on on the, one of those boxes and sure. you know the dot could be the center of uh, of a driver which means your personality leans towards being a driver in the group or your personality leans towards being an analytical personality in the group mm -hmm. right so they did mine and uh, my dot came down right in the center of all four squares and my <laughs> my guy said that's not supposed to happen. We've never seen that. And I said, what do you mean never seen it? And I said, no, that doesn't happen. I, what, uh, what kind of personality are you? And I said, well, I, you know, it's a cop. I just adapt my style to who I'm talking to. I think it's the best way to communicate, right? So if you're an emotional person, I'm going to give you a hug. And if you're analytical, I'm going to show you how to do a hug mathematically, right? And there's just different ways to do it. And he said, the problem with that is um, if you're giving employee A a hug, employee B is going, how come I don't get a hug? Not that I want to hug because I'm an analytical, <laughs> but it can create kind of perception of favoritism. So then I had to adopt a style, which is kind of a neutral personality, so to speak, in public, in the public you know, with employees and things like that. So everybody gets hugs and everyone gets the analysis, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, everybody gets like nothing, really. I mean, like no one of, here got a hug. What's yeah, going I on? Know. No, I know. I, I, my insurance, I haven't paid my premiums. So I got to be careful about that. So those are the type of tests you might do where you kind of look at groups and individuals and come up with personalities. So explain that in a group setting. We would do uh, those sort of tests, or, or organizational consultant would do those types of tests, really to look at, you're right, if someone is more analytical, if someone's more of a leader, and then to help with the uh, team and everyone to understand who uh, would be best on which team and how they would work better together. And also to look at the managerial styles to see which uh, type of manager might be best suited to fit with leading which team. Now, is this done in, a, in an open kind of environment where, the, you know, we have a meeting, everybody comes in and fills it out together, and we participate together as a team, or is it more you're hired uh, to do a behind-the-scenes evaluation? Uh, both. Okay. Yeah, it, it depends on the referral question. It depends on the needs of the corporation. What's the, what, what, in your opinion, what's the best way to do that? I don't think that there is the best way. I think that it, we really, uh, at uh, PAI, we adapt. You have to match the culture of the company you're going into. What works in one company might not work at all in another. Right. I mean, a bank is very different than an entertainment company. Well, that's company. true. That's true. I mean, I, I just always side towards kind of open source things. It just makes it easier. It avoids people believing something that's not true and that kind of thing, you know. But I could see you might have to do it confidentially, so to speak. Well, I mean, it also depends on the tools that we're using because some of the tools are better uh, left for people to do individually. And then some of the tools we might use are better in a collaborative group setting. Talk about the tools. What do we do? Is it a checkout box test or flashcards or pictures or what? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all, all of those. There, here. there are a number of different types right. of tests, and a lot of them are uh, based on, you know, like the, the true false uh, questions or the Likert scales. Um, and then some of them are more of the, you know, pin the tail on the box. <laughs> Oh, so that you were talking about. Oh, you're saying so mine was a lesser, uh, yeah, less important I, test. I see. And, okay. and, and I actually would not necessarily utilize that test. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but that's more of a like a lighthearted, fun type of team well, building test that you would use in a group. And I don't have to pay consulting fees to do it. So that's and, probably one reason they did it, I'm sure. But, right, right. Yeah. And that's not, not one of the tests that you have to pay for. So. <laughs> All right. So the outcome of one of these uh, group tests, what, uh, what kind of uh, what, what, what things do you deliver to show the, the client? 
are we always saying like, here's five people in your group, here's their five personalities, and here's group, that's group A, and group B has these five personalities. Maybe you guys ought to switch a couple people in different groups to work together. Is that kind of a goal? That could be the goal. There could be other, mm-hmm. yeah. You might say you have you have four leaders in this team, and that's why everybody argues all the time. Oh, that's you don't a good get point. anything done. Yeah, you know? that's right. a good point. You guys should do a police department. <laughs> well, well, maybe th- if the police department calls us, we would be happy to do the police I got a, I got a theory on that. Um, so you have, I'm going to say alpha male, but really it's alpha female. It's both. You have mm-hmm. alpha personalities. Mm-hmm. You can't be a wallflower mm-hmm. to be a police officer. Right. Now, the interesting yeah. thing there is that at the top of the chain, you're super alpha. And then at the bottom of the chain, you're not so super alpha. They're still alphas, right? And the question is, how do they all work together without having huge conflicts. And for the most part, they don't have the conflicts. They work mm-hmm. together, which is very different. I think you don't see that anywhere else, except maybe like in wartime where, you know, it's a necessity for you have my back and sort of thing. Um, I think that uh, the police department, uh, correctional officers, and the military all attract a certain personality yeah. type that does well as a team with the hierarchical uh, structure, someone to look up to. Uh, one of the other problems, though, that Dr. Vizipal and I both uh, understand is that it also attracts a lot of individuals who might meet criteria for antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy. And All um, right, let's talk about that. That's when I took the MMPI, uh, they showed us a chart and said, here's you, police officer, and here's mm-hmm. a criminal. Mm-hmm. And the lines were almost identical except for the social part. We were below the antisocial line. Right. But very similar personalities. You know, it's like make decisions, take charge, be able to communicate with people. Some, you know, A lot of social skills, really, frankly, uh, which is ironic to me that people consider police officers antisocial nowadays. Because you can't, you really can't do that job if you're antisocial. You got to be able to walk in a situation and in five minutes say, "All right, you got three players here. This one wants to kill this one. I got to come over to down and solve the problem in five five minutes." And sometimes it's thirty seconds to evaluate what's going on. Right. Well, there's Just antisocial risk taking and yeah. impulsivity. There is a lot of that. Absolutely. Right. I mean, if I'm going to go out and run around and chase a guy in a car with the lights and sirens on, that's risk taking. Sure. But right. we all love it. We all thought well, it was and great. You have to do it for we your job. We wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Well. You have to do it for your job, but you wouldn't even apply for that job if that bothered you. Sure. You know, and I, I don't really know many and police that's, officers. That, that's why it attracts people with antisocial personality disorder. So how do those people get along in a group when they're all a very similar personality and they're all want to be in charge of everything? Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, if we had four guys on a shift, there's always one guy that was the, the lead personality, so to speak. But the other people wouldn't necessarily follow him if he wasn't effective and fair. They would just say, okay, go ahead and go blah, blah, blah. We're, we're going to do our own thing anyway. So... I mean, there's so many problems in police work now. I'm just wondering how your services could help police departments with these image things. I think it's wrong. I think they're upside down and backwards, but that's what the perception is, you know. I think that being able to go in and let people know where everyone stands, what people's strengths and weaknesses are, and uh, to give some better understanding of group cohesion would be the best route. What's group cohesion? Being able to work together as a group. That was too simple. I wanted five minutes on that, but I just was going to get 30 seconds. That's all right. If you want five minutes, let's talk about psychopathy. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about psychopathy. Okay. So what were we, we were just talking about personality disorders. Now, psychopathy right. distinguished how? Well, there's a lot of things that go into it. So there's the glibness, the superficial, the manipulative, the impulsive, the risk-taking. The list goes on and on and on. Well, keep going because I want to hear all the things. <laughs> what else do we have? Well, there's a couple areas that, that build into psychopathy. Mm-hmm. One is the lack of remorse. Mm-hmm. One is the effective, you know, the the emotionality. So lack of empathy. The people with yes, psychopathy yeah. don't feel the range of emotions that quote normal people feel. So if I got a personality disorder, I'm sliding down into the abyss if I'm getting into psychopathy. I'm I'm I'm, I'm on my way to being not functional. It, not all used, of them, right? It no. used to be thought of that. Um, Psychopathy was a combination of antisocial and narcissistic personality disorders. Right. We're actually moving away from that paradigm, and the reason why is because of the brain imaging research. Mm-hmm. There's several uh, researchers in the area. Kent Keel is one of the uh, most renowned that is looking at brain imaging and finding areas of the brain that correlate with psycho- psychopathic tendencies. Like so, a small hypothalamus or what? Well, so theoretically people are born that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The amygdala oh. is one of the areas they're looking at. Oh, they're leaning that way. Okay. Uh, a lot of skin galvanic responses. Uh, there's a lot of research into that. Makes me nervous. Mm. We've had this in history before, right? So distinguish why this is more scientific than it was, let's say, in World War II, as an example. Much better brain imaging. Okay. Yes. 
right? And much more controlled studies. So instead of, like, like you said, way back in the day, they used to do uh, personality tests, ask a few questions and say, OK, this person meets criteria for safe psychopathy. Now we are a lot more scientific about it. We do ask questions, but we also look at collateral resources. We look at uh, re research. We look at uh, records. We look at history. And um, then we can come to the conclusion if someone meets criteria for psychopathy based on past behavior. Now, is psychopathy something that we would uh, lock somebody up for? For an evaluation, whereas personality disorders, we're just going to say, you no. know what, you can function, but no, okay, well, well I because committed an offense, right, yeah. right, the ones okay. that committed an offense, certainly, and we've got, um, you know, some f fairly renowned individuals who meet psych criteria for psychopathy. Okay, your favorite, Charles Manson. There you go. <laughs> he wasn't a psychotic. He wasn't a schizophrenic. He wasn't all those crazy, terrible things. Mm -hmm. Well, he was very, you know, charismatic and planning and can very lead people and stuff. Very yeah. manipulative. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Cunning. Mm -hmm. Grandiose. So if we took, if we look at these things, do, do these extremes come from a lesser treated symptom? So if I go from, <clears throat> you know, I'm just a little weird to psychopathy, is that a pathway? Did I start out weird and nobody checked me and nobody adjusted me socially to say, Billy, uh, don't do that at the dinner table. And I just kept acting that way reinforced by no, nobody intervening, and do I grow up into the psych, psycho, uh, psychopathy area? You know, or, or you just, like you say, if you're born that way, you're just going to be that way forever. I don't know. I think, I think social corrections, and we look at this in shooters, right? You know, the guy that shoots everybody is usually the guy that was you know, in the group, and now he's way out of the group, and nobody brought him back in. Well, and there's also the, uh, might be more in lines with sociopath, where if there had been some in intervention, things might be different. Well, the, well, yeah, intervention or correction, I'm saying. Because if, you, if you're antisocial and you are not brought in, into whatever group you started in and you're not given a hug, and, and I, I mean, well, I'm only being half serious, but I mean, you know, you, you got it. We're dependent beings. We don't live on Gilligan's Island by ourselves. Okay? Well, we gotta we've got su interact. successful psychopaths. Mm -hmm. There are often attorneys, uh, politicians. <laughs> okay. um, All right, now, CEOs. now my CEOs. CEOs. Yeah. There's a my lot insurance of CEOs. is not going to cover that. We're going to come after you. Right. Well, uh, there's a book called Snakes and Suits that yeah. outlines the successful psychopath, and these are people who theoretically have the same brain structures or you know differences in brain structure as the unsuccessful psychopath Manson, and yet they've learned pro-social skills. And so, to answer your question, you know, is is a psychopath born or made? Right. Um, you know, a little bit of both. If okay. someone was is born with these brain structures that are different from other individuals, then theoretically they would have the lack of compassion, the uh, callous and unemotional brain. behaviors, lack of remorse. Right. So, is a big distinguisher in psychopathy or psych, uh, psychotic personalities a lack of empathy? Is that a, a big? Cue? That's the hallmark. That's yeah. the hallmark. Okay. Now, uh, there's empathy and sympathy. I think people can fake sympathy. Oh, I gotta send a get well soon card because they're in the hospital. I intellectually I just have to do that. But that doesn't mean empathetically identify and I wish they were really dead, but I'm gonna send a card anyway, because I'll look better. There's the societal behavior that you can act it, you can fake it. Right. You, and that's sympathy. And then there's the feeling. Yeah. So they don't so the lack of empathy is I'm not identifying you with a feeling, I'm identifying you with you intellectually mm -hmm. based on the situational awareness, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And some of the research that's out there is saying if we can identify children earlier and earlier that have the tendency to develop psychopathy, then we can target empathy building in that we can teach them uh, to understand the consequences of their actions. And if they want to get their needs met, they're going to have to be pro-social. So there's a lot of talk about you know, autism and uh, Asperger autism is kind of an antisocial form of a personality, right? They don't really... Connect with people. Is that, can you teach somebody is, like that? Or? Antisocial is poorly named. Okay. It doesn't mean that they're not social. It means that they have a tendency to get angry really fast, take things personally, um, be uh, impulsive, irritable, irresponsible, have a reckless disregard for safety. That doesn't mean that they're not the life of the party. No, oh. mm -hmm. it's right. just it's kind of poorly named. So when people hear antisocial, they think of the the angry guy or the bully. And while the person might be the bully, they might also be the prep boy or the jock who everyone loves, who's putting down everyone who's on the other team. Right. So in psycho in psychopathy, do we have clusters? Same way. Mm -hmm. well, oh, I know clusters. I like clusters. <laughs> it's easy for me to remember. Yeah. Why is there no clusters in psychopathy? 
there's just the specific traits that are evaluated based on their lifelong patterns. And there's yeah. less of those sort of identifiers than there are in the, the previous personality disorder, so to speak. Sure. So you have a personality disorder profile, and then if you add a couple more to it, we're going into psychopathy. Is that a good way to describe it? Is that an oversimplified security guy ready way to say it? Yeah, it's a no person. Yeah, pretty good. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it's theoretically the extreme mm -hmm. of the antisocial and the narcissistic together. All right. Um, and we, we had always just thought that it was a kind of extreme personality disorder, and yet there's uh, research that suggests that it's not necessarily just a defense that can be changed with therapy, but more of uh, something that's neurologically based. So we talked about this on the way from the airport. Uh, one of our security radio fans, a granny, we'll call her, average person that thinks this stuff is interesting, showed a good question, and I'm going to paraphrase it here. She says, um, in, two in 2013, personality disorders were classified as mental disorders. Uh, and you said that's not exactly true, but is there some truth to there's some kind of... No, personality disorders have always been considered uh, a mental disorder. It's just that uh, in 2013, the way of, of understanding personality disorders versus other disorders went away. It was uh, in the dsm 4 it was the axis system, and the dsm 5 we just have bullets. But all of them are uh, considered focuses of treatment. The problem with personality disorders, though, is that HMOs don't pay for it. So, oh, now that's interesting. Right. If, you, if okay. you go to your doctor, for example, with borderline personality disorder, right. and your moods are all over the place, and you're uh, idealizing and evaluating and having problems with your family and um, you know feelings of chronic emptiness and suicidal gestures, then what might happen is you're diagnosed with bipolar. Yes. Right. Because uh, the hospitals will pay for bipolar disorder. They won't pay for borderline personality disorder. All right. Because so mental disorder has a really terrible stigma to it, right? I mean, personality disorder, we can all say that's quirky. But if you say mental, people are thinking, well, that guy's whacked, I can't work with them or something, right? Personality disorders have terrible stigmas mm -hmm. associated with them. But yeah. I think the word Especially is... Borderline. But the words, Especially borderline. Well, to you guys, right? But I mean, listen, everybody I deal with well, has a personality also. disorder, right? Yeah. Mm. Media um, and HMOs, I mean, they seriously won't pay for the treatment. Very interesting. And and movies and for, especially. What was that? Movies especially, how they're presented in movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it just sounds better to say personality disorder than it does to say mental. It just does. Well, it, mental implies that my brain's not working. The fact is that we don't have mental disorders per se. We have mood disorders, psychotic disorders, personality disorders, ch disorders of childhood, mm -hmm. uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, or what they call now uh, anxiety disorders. Right. So there's all different types of disorders. Um, as psychologists, we don't call them necessarily mental disorders, uh, mental health issues. Well, you don't. Right. But I mean, sure. on, the, on the social side, it's like that's just the buzzword. It just, you know, like the guy that. Just shot up uh, the the abortion clinic, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks he's crazy. No, I don't think he's crazy. I think he believes what he believes and did what he did, and he has some kind of cognitive reasoning and ability to come up with a tactical plan. Mm -hmm. And he's not, you know, thinking it's uh, you know 1908 or something. He's out of it, right? So, my question is this: since uh, you know, in 19, my my grandma was born in 1888. Okay, she died at 100 years old, right? And she saw, you know, covered wagons and steamboats on the Columbia all the way to going to the moon. And amazing things that she, that you know, that span of time she saw things, right? And in that time, the social mores and social acceptance things have drastically changed in her 100 years, right? So something when she was born was considered crazy and wacky, we're going to lock you up. And 100 years later, that's just what everybody does. How does your business uh, function on that? It's a sliding scale. I mean, what was crazy 10 years ago is now, whoa, it's perfectly okay to take selfies of everybody, you know, doing weird stuff. <laughs> and we accept that, right? Yeah. I mean, how, where, do you, where do you draw the line between uh, let's take this personality thing off the table because everybody does that now and therefore it's not considered a disorder. And well, yeah. Makes sense? I was going to say that's why the manuals are revamped, the diagnostic manuals revamped so often. With more research and with more understanding, we can change the criteria. We can change the diagnostic criteria. I did read something about selfies and the psychology behind that. I mean, it's like <laughs> really every day you got and basically the same shot, right? Of people go. in well, not too long ago, homosexuality was considered a disorder. Well, that's that's a good one, yeah. Right. And now that's more accepted. I mean, mm -hmm. it's almost fully accepted. I mean, well, in my circles, it's accepted. It's like, so what? Big deal, you know. I mean, I don't want you waving a sign in my face. Just like I'm not going to wave a heterosexual sign in your face because that's my personal business. But who cares? 
I mean, it's it's fine. It's acceptable. Right. But the change isn't that personality disorders aren't or are a mental health issue. It's just how we list them is different. Okay, right. so you guys have a secret book. <laughs> so what was going on in 1908 is still inside the book there because it's still not normal, but even though it accepts it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I think you could run into a danger where we we classify something as a disorder where really if 95% of the people do it, is it a, is it a disorder? No, well, no. That's that's absolutely true. Okay. The other thing is is that what the APA, the organization that, that puts out the DSM, the, the book that we use. Okay, acronyms explained. Okay. A- American AP. Psychiatric, Psychiatric Association. Association. Okay, good. And the, the Diagnostic, Diagnostic Statistical Manual. <laughs> so the, the, the manual that we use uh, requires that there be research behind these conditions. Oh. Right. So we don't just say, That's hey, good we, news. we just thought of a new one and we like it, so let's right. put it in. No. There has to be a body of research to and, support. And a body of people, many, many psychiatrists and psychologists and other experts in the field that debate the merits of every single diagnosis and the criteria that goes into it. For example, the DSM-5 has relisted Asperger's uh, syndrome as exp- Asperger's, or I'm sorry, autism spectrum disorder. So Asperger's, which had ex- uh, been in the DSM-4, is now under the autism spectrum, which now encompasses several other childhood disorders. So with research, we, you know, re-understand, we understand things in a different way. All right, so devil's advocate again. What, what is that noise again? It's time for a break. The old steamer go on again? <laughs> yeah. It's very strange. Uh, so distinguish between what you guys are doing, which just sounds all very clinical and scientific and all that kind of thing, and uh, let's take a group of uh, forensic neuropsychologists and call them uh, weathermen. And they're all going to decide that the world is freezing or it's getting too hot. Same kind of process, right? Look at all the data that says we're getting warm. And here's all the data that says we're getting cold. And nobody knows the answer, supposedly, right? I mean, then it comes down to a personal opinion, which causes this public debate. If there's a body of knowledge and it's created by the same people that uh, are diagnosing how do you keep it all straight to make sure we don't get it wrong in your business? You know what I'm saying? Well, they're not actually the people that are diagnosing per se because there's research that's being done all over the globe in a number of different areas. So a researcher is going to be different than somebody that's in your world, which is applying or analyzing or searching for what they researched. Yeah. I, I think that that there's, there's some. There, there's some psychologists that uh, are purely researchers. There's some psychologists that are clinical and actually practice and also do research. Um, and then, of course, there's many psychologists that are just clinical and they, they only right. do uh, you know treatment. But um, what I'm saying is that there's a number of different research, researchers that aren't necessarily psychologists at all that oh. are doing research on different areas. They're of a PhD of something and they just like sure. to do research and gather data. And so right. data is what we use to classify these people as different things. Right. Does it vary from country to country? Are Americans wackier than uh, people in Finland or something? <laughs> um, I read something about Norway uh, having more uh, individuals that are diagnosed with avoidant personality disorder oh. and schizoid personality mm-hmm. disorder, uh, whereas and less borderline, I think. Uh, yeah, and mm. less less indiv- borderline and antisocial. Whereas I believe the United States has a much higher level mm-hmm. of narcissistic borderline and um, antisocial antisocial individuals. Well, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you're living sure. in the dark for six months in like Norway, you're <laughs> <laughs> be kind of, uh, you know, right. kind of it affects your personality. Well, you we, also have to think how quickly research about the brain is changing and evolving. Right. So we're learning new things every day that might be incorporated in the next DSM and the one after that. Well, because of the science. I mean, yeah. the technology is there to take pictures and show things mm-hmm. that weren't there before. Yeah. Uh, we talked about drugs on the way from the airport. Let's talk about that. Uh, in, in all of this, the psychopathy and personality disorders, are we seeing the introduction of drugs at this early onset as opposed to Hey, you're bipolar, dude. You're over the edge. We've got to do something about it. Here's some pills. Do, the, do we use uh, drugs to treat these type of things? I'm guessing not. I don't know. Well, there's also sometimes comorbid. Comorbid. Oh, my God. I can't <laughs> so remember all these things. someone that also has a diagnosis of depression. Yeah. You might see antidepressants used then. Even though they have a, a lesser 
personality disorder, so to speak? Well, uh, I think the main personality disorder that also has comorbid mood disorders is borderline personality disorder, and that's the disorder that often gets uh, medication as well because they have suicidal gestures and a really, really difficult time with emotional dysregulation. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other disorders uh, often, you uh, you don't have a uh, medication that can treat a personality disorder because personality disorder in essence is your way of seeing the world and it's your, well, yeah. your defense that's gone awry. So there's no magic pill that can help with that. It's really pervasive and long lasting. And the younger you are that you're diagnosed with it, the better uh, outcome you would have because therapy can help you with coping and seeing things in a different Coping's way. Coping's a big key. I mean, that's the How you cope is actually whether you cross over into something that's acceptable or not acceptable really, exactly. for other people. So Granny asks, uh, what's a post-treatment success rate with a personality or psychopathy? Do they, do they go into treatment? Do they seek treatment? Are they able to be adjusted or? Are they more likely to seek treatment for a, for a different disorder? And then right. it will be also uh, added in. So this stuff we're talking about, kind of yeah, in this series, we're talking about things that are just kind of how people are. Mm-hmm. And most people in this, these categories kind of function. They get by. Sure. Certain yeah. clusters seek treatment more than others. Like what? Mm-hmm. Which one? Well, narcissists rarely come to treatment unless guess someone that. in their family <laughs> sends them. <laughs> or unless it so, benefits right. them somehow. So that you hear, yeah. my wife sent me, my, right. my husband sent me, or my I'm treating parents myself. sent me. Right. <laughs> Antisocial uh, individuals end up in prison. You know, that's, okay. and whereas borderline individuals often end up in the ER. Mm-hmm. And so that when we say that m- many of them seek treatment, I think borderline personality disorder is one of the most understood. And uh, the proponents for treatment, including Marsha Linehan, who wrote the book on it, yeah. um, has developed an entire way of working with those individuals. Other personality disorders, like Dr. Vizipal was saying, don't seek treatment unless something's come up, and often that's in. You know, family therapy, couples therapy. Yeah, or somebody's getting divorced and saying, "Hey, my husband does A, B, and C. We got to look at that or something." Fitness for duty evaluations. Yeah, well, we should. Well, let's talk about shootings in oh. a little bit, okay? So, are we going to take shooters and put them into these sort of classifications for psychopathy and personality disorders? Because, in my view, you got to be halfway normal to make a plan. These are tactical plans. These require planning. They require thinking. And you know, somebody that's way gone, I don't see them sitting down with a, a, me, a metrics and saying, oh, I'm going to draw this little chart and make these pictures and things like that. Uh, I think people that go out and shoot other people are emotionally detached. I think you can't shoot somebody unless you're not completely, you know, disassociated with them. And and I, my other belief is that um, they're true believers. They believe in what they're doing. In other words, they don't really think it's wrong. They really believe that it's okay to kill these people for whatever reason they define that as. You know, I was picked on. My grandmother didn't like me. Or in the recent case, the abortion clinic, the guy said, uh, I don't like these videos about the abortions. Well, it wasn't rhetoric because it, it's true. There are those videos, and his opinion was they weren't good. So he wasn't making things up about why he did it. We just know it's not the right thing to do, obviously. So, But any of those people could also have a personality disorder. A personality disorder doesn't preclude people from being able to plan things. In fact, it might even contribute to it. Uh, there's, oh, like they're obsessive about something. There, well, there's a pretty well-known um, uh, school shooter in uh, Massachusetts uh, who has narcissistic personality disorder, and he had convinced himself that um, by being able to purchase the gun and get it shipped to his school, um, that he was, you know, meant to kill the people that he um, was upset about, and so that's why he did what he did. And so I think that if we were to look at each of the shooters individually and figure out what's going on with them behind the scenes, we might actually see flavors of many of the different personality disorders. So here's one of my theories. Mr. Jarvis, did I talk about this on one of the shows? I can't remember. But I'm trying to put this out in copyright so in case somebody comes up with a PhD and claims it, it was really me who came up with it first. I think one thing we don't study in the shooter, shooting area is the tendency for suicide, for mm-hmm. suicidal thoughts, right? Because, you know, like 85% of these people that go out and shoot somebody uh, kill themselves when somebody shows up. Oh, hi, I'm a security guard with no gun, and uh, I'm just going to say don't do that. Okay, let me kill myself. Boom. That has happened, literally, right? Any confrontation, they do that. Or when the cops show up, it's the cops are going to kill me. And we find that in their plans that they put on, you know, the Internet and talk about this, that, and everything, they don't have exit plans. 
Okay, what I plan on doing is after I killed everybody in the library, I'm going to get in a taxi and go to Puerto Rico. All right? They don't have exit plans. And so if we could identify suicidal tendencies in people more clearly, maybe intervention at that level would catch mathematically. Eventually, we might catch some of these people saying, wait a minute, you're suicidal. And I looked in your notebook, and it's got a drawing of the classroom with little people's faces and X's in their eyes, and this is who you're going to kill. You know, because once you intervene at any level on those those shooters pre-incident, you will find the knowledge of the of the crime and what they're planning. It's usually, you know, it's in a book, it's on a wall, something like that. Any thoughts on that? Because suicidal, you know, you, you see these, these ads that say, uh, you know, medicine A will cure your yellow toenails. Well, that's great, but it will also cause you to kill yourself, so be careful. Well, I don't want to take it, right? And then, you know, it happens. Right. Um, you know, I think that... Um in the cases of many of these school shooters, you're right in that there's an underlying mood disorder. Often it's been correlated with a lot of depression or dysthymia, especially in the teenagers. What's dysthymia? Dysthymia is a um, lower grade type of depression. Depression is either like a major depressive episode, which is often characterized by not being able to get out of bed, not being able to function like you normally would, but it's also shorter lived, only a few weeks to a few months. Whereas dysthymia is every day, all day, more days than not. Uh, low self-esteem, uh, low motivation, insomnia, just kind of the e- yeah, mm-hmm. f- you know. If yeah, you, see, I, you see this in teenagers a lot. They mm-hmm. kind of go these phases of like right. zero energy, zero motivation, and, and they snap out of it mostly. You know, sometimes and sometimes yeah. it's it, it lasts for over a year, and if right. it lasts for over a year, then it's diagnosed as per- pervasive. Uh, depressive disorder, disorder. Uh, otherwise known as dysthymic disorder. And so we see that in teenagers who then begin to ruminate on all of the injustices that are going on around them and how they just want to you know, take it out on someone. And so teenage boys, uh, they often manifest their depression as anger. And a lot of depressed teenage boys will fight. And they'll get in a lot of different fights and they'll fight with everyone. Whereas teenage girls who have dysthymia or depression are often more withdrawn. And so uh, when we see these depressed teenage boys uh, taking out their anger on others, then we see the the school shootings. So, of course, if there's an an ability to intervene early on uh, and, and treat that depression, then, you know, the the plot to get revenge will go away. Not too much. I. I have to check my research, but um, I don't remember too many female shooters. Mm. There are some, but very rarely. It's because Is, girls act in. They, they yeah, take their anger out on themselves. So what do you think about my theory, Venus? We talked about yeah. this going coming over in the car, right? So maybe maybe it's a pre-incident indicator? Maybe? I don't know. You had some- I would be very interested to see uh, if there are any suicide indicators. Like you hadn't mentioned if you had seen any. In the research. Well, like the Virginia Tech guy wrote some really weird stuff in his English class as part mm-hmm. of his, I'm going to turn my paper in. The English well, he, he's like, written Whoa. a lot of aggressive things. Right. And he talked to a lot of people about anger and being angry with people, um, some really weird stuff you mentioned. But a lot of people that are having suicidal thoughts talk about having suicidal thoughts. Right. It's it's one of the other precursors of of. Having well, that's true. They do talk, yeah, they say something about it casually. They say, even. They, they say something about it, or they start giving away their things, or there's a lot of indicators. So I would be really interested to see if in any of these school shootings, if there were any of those sorts of indicators. Well, if that component was coupled with a withdrawal from the group and you know some cognitive aggression and things like that, then that might be like, hey, wait a minute. Because it seems to be a very common theme among the people that, that go in to sh- shoot people that, you know, where's your exit plan? You know, because an average guy would say, I'm pissed off, I'm going to kill you, but I'm going to go move to Alaska now so you can't catch me. And these guys don't do that. Because I, I'm wondering if it's an uh, if it's a strategy thing. Well, yeah, I'm going to put up my plan for what I'm going to do. I wouldn't put up my exit strategy because I don't want the cops to know what my exit strategy yeah, I, is because I don't want them blocking my exit. Uh, yeah, but I don't think so because they don't they don't tend to flee. They just very rarely just say, I'm going to go out the back door, which they – and by the way, uh, since the average response time is, you know – 10 minutes for a cop and the shooting lasts four minutes. They got plenty of time to get away, plenty of time to get away in all these cases. And they just don't. They just choose not to. And, and that would be in keeping with someone who's very depressed, right? If they are very depressed and they've kind of put in their mind that there's going to be a suicide by cop or they don't care if they get caught, they've yeah. just taken it out on whoever they needed to take it out on, then, you know, you've, you've been justified. So let's talk about medication. So mm-hmm. do you think... You said something very interesting that I 
that I never picked up on before. So we're depressed, and so we put you on an antidepressant, and mm-hmm. then the second we do that, you're going to kill yourself. And I said, that doesn't make any sense to me. But when you explained that, it, it did make sense. Uh, yes, and that's one of the reasons that anytime someone's going uh, to take an antidepressant for the very first time, treatment providers will get their uh, support system on board because they have now the energy to carry out what they've been unconsciously thinking about or even consciously ruminating about uh, for a long time, which is ending it all. So it doesn't, so, the drug, in your uh, opinion, doesn't turn them into. Uh, automatically, oh, I have suicidal thoughts now. No. Those were already there. Yeah. Right. I've never heard it explained that way. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. What's there any research on that? I believe so. And I think mm-hmm. that's why it's uh, standard care to uh, inform individuals of the s- potential side effects, which might be you m- might be suicidal, uh, and also to help individuals realize that they need a strong support system around them to take care of them while they're starting any new medication, whether it be an antidepressant or an antipsychotic or anti-anxiety medication. So the drugs actually make them normal, and their normal is. No. I always wanted to kill myself in the first place. No, no, that doesn't make them normal at all. I think that um, medication, f- this is my own personal bias, is never the answer in and of itself. Yeah. You always need to couple it f- with therapy, and you always need to couple it with uh, a stronger support system and to change your environment. And um, that's that's one of the reasons that medication w- helps only in so far. So there's no happy pill that cures a mood disorder and might alleviate some symptoms. Um But in the long term, you really need to learn the coping skills to help you. You know, it's interesting. In your profession, I have psychiatrists who Mm -hmm. can issue medicine and psychologists who cannot issue medicine. Am I correct? Yeah. So just by the mere fact that you can't issue medicine, you have to come up with a different solution, period. Mm -hmm. And we're so heavily medicated in America. I've looked at some charts. like We're way at the top of the most prescribed medicines for all kinds of things, right? Uh, And I just wonder if that's part of a cause causation issue. I don't know. I, I try to stay away from all drugs if I can, you know, but um, you just see more and more of this. Everybody's got to have a pill. My little brother who died was on 21 medications when he died because he took a pill for depression. He took a, and that made him sick. So he had to take one for his nausea and then he took one for drinking and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden that mix, he can't sustain that. Your right. body's not designed for that. You know, right. it's not a chemical repository. Exactly. And uh, that's why for most mental health disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, short-term medication is what's uh, needed, not the happy pill to be on for the rest of your life. Right. There's very, very few reasons that you would need that. Um, there's other mental health disorders such as schizophrenia that a lot of those individuals need medications for the rest of their life just to regulate because their brain doesn't regulate the way other brains do. Well, I think I'll have to hire you because I, <laughs> I've identified several of these top. Mr. Roberts, have you identified anything? So, uh, yes, I think we're a little wacky here at the uh, at the show. <laughs> uh, so we got about a couple minutes left. So let's go over uh, how we get a hold of you guys. All right. right. So it's Psychological Assessment Incorporated. You guys are out of the San Francisco area, and your website is psychassessment.us. That's right. Now let me spell that for my nieces and nephews who can't spell. P s y c h a s s e s s m e n t dot u s, and. Uh, just, again, give us a quick overview of your services and what you provide for, for people. Uh, we provide all different types of psychological testing and assessment from the uh, forensic realm to the corporate realm to the personal realm, learning disabilities, ADHD accommodations, uh, and neuropsychological testing for people with functional assessments for after a stroke or head injury. Uh, and then in the corporate realm, we do fitness for duty and risk assessments. We also provide uh, sex offender therapy and sex offender treatment and risk assessments for uh, sex offenders, whether it be individuals accused of sexually offending in a custody case or um, even post-conviction. Uh, My guests have been Rachel Dempsey, Michelle Visipal, and Venus Klinger. <laughs> What was that, Mr. Drivers? Very loud. What, what happened? <laughs> Turn that down. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> We're sending you in. You're going in after the show. <laughs> Thanks for coming on Security Guy Radio. It's been really fascinating. We'll go on with our next series uh, of our five-part series. We'll be talking about uh, pedophilia next, I think, right? So pedophilia. tune in. Security Guy Radio for our next episode, and thanks for listening.